Um, I'd actually like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land, being the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to other Indigenous people here. My name is Wean Tan and I'm the 2016 Executive Editor of the University of New South Wales Law Journal. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the launch of issue 39.2, which is the second of four issues to be published this year. In particular, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Professor Reg Graycar, to John Pavlakis and the partners and solicitors of Ashurst, to Professor George Williams, the Dean of the UNSW Law Faculty, as well as, of course, the editorial board of our journal and its alumni. I would also like to welcome a number of this issue's contributing authors who are here tonight. Harry Hobbs, Associate Professor Christopher Ryan, Dr. Sasha Callahan, and Professor Luke McNamara. We are very proud of our work and our status as one of Australia's premier academic legal journals. But our achievements would not be possible without the generous contributions of others who might now like to take some time to acknowledge. On behalf of the journal, I would first like to thank Ashurst, our hosts, for this evening. In 1981, Dawson Waldron, as it was then known, sponsored issue 4-1. For the next 20 years, Blake Dawson Waldron continued to support our journal. Today, Ashurst is a leading international law firm and its work is characterized by the pursuit of excellence. When we started publishing four issues annually, it was only sensible for us to approach Ashurst. We are grateful for their support of tonight's event and we look forward to developing an ongoing relationship in the future. I thank John Pavlakis for welcoming us here this evening and Joe Dean and Leanne Price for their considerable assistance in helping to organize and coordinate this event. I would also like to thank our three other premier sponsors, Allens, Herbert Smith Freehills, and King and Wood Mallisons for their continued support of our journal. As a student-run journal, we are grateful to our Dean, Professor George Williams, and to our faculty advisors, Associate Professors Michael Handler and Dr. Lyra Bennett Moses, we thank them for their advice and their encouragement in the difficult publication process. Tonight's issue is the last that will be published during Associate Professor Michael Handler's term as our faculty advisor, which is a position he has held since 2006. Michael, for many years, has answered our questions, averted potential crises, and made thoughtful suggestions, all in his quiet, measured way. We are very grateful for his generosity and his time. Rather fittingly, Michael has been cited in this issue in Sanderson's article beginning at page 658, <laughs> about a dozen times. So, Thank you, Michael, for being such an excellent faculty advisor. Next, I'd like to thank the student editorial board, who have diligently edited every article in this issue several times over. Our editors will spend their weekends visiting libraries all over Sydney to track down obscure books, and I'm privileged to work with such dedicated and talented people. Finally, I would like to congratulate Bridget McManus, the editor of this issue. I'm sometimes asked, believe it or not, what I actually do as the executive editor of a journal. And the answer is, not a whole lot when you work with people like Bridget. For 15 months, Bridget has solicited submissions, coordinated peer review, managed the editing process carefully, and revised proof after proof before printing. Bridget has proven also that journal editors can have fun a substantial portion of issue 39.2 was produced overseas. Publication decisions were made in LA. Final edits were coordinated in Berlin and Madrid. Proofing was done on a beach in Croatia. And the editorial was written on a long, but I'm told, lovely train ride from Frankfurt to Vienna. I hope this encourages more of our board members to nominate as issue editors in future. There is fun to be had. Bridget has been an absolute pleasure to work with. Thanks to her careful planning and devastating efficiency, Bridget's editing Super Saturday, a journal tradition, was the shortest in recent memory, finishing by 7.30 p.m. instead of the usual midnight. Congratulations, Bridget, on launching this outstanding issue. On that note, I'd like to welcome John Pavlakis to speak on behalf of the firm. John is a partner at Ashurst in litigation and dispute resolution. He has been involved in high-profile class actions and corporate recovery actions, as well as leading test cases in medical indemnity. We are grateful for his time. Thank you, John. 
Good evening and welcome. I'm glad you could all join us here tonight. I'm a proud alumnus of the University of New South Wales Law School, back in the days when the law school lived on top of the library. Things were much different back in the 70s and early 80s. The hair was better, the fashion was probably not so great. I know things have moved on and I have had the benefit of seeing the great new law school building at the lower campus. On behalf of the partners and solicitors and staff at Ashurst, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all. In particular, Professor George Williams, who is actually also an alumnus of the firm, and I know because he used to work for me. <laughs> After a couple of years, he came up to me and said, John, I want to do constitutional law. And he said goodbye. <laughs> uh, he decided to go off to do constitutional law and become very famous. So welcome back, George. I'd also like to, to uh, welcome Professor Greycar, who's the uh, keynote speaker this evening, and of course, all of the University of New South Wales law students and potential summer clerks. Uh, Ashurst has had a, a great tradition of supporting the University of New South Wales. Mention was made earlier of 1981. That's when I first started here as a young grad, but I was born at a young age, so I'm younger than it seems. Uh, tonight marks the launch of the University of New South Wales Law Journal issue 39.2. I'm sure it's a bumper issue, and I'm very glad that you could join us here today in our ballroom, here in our new offices at 5 Martin Place. We are in what used to be the Commonwealth Bank ballroom, and there are many factors and issues uh, that would have been dealt with here over the years. Uh, for those of you with a historical interest, there is around the corner on this floor the old Prime Minister's office, which was used by Prime Ministers since Federation uh, to um, Prime Minister Hawke in the early 1980s before the bank was privatised. It's a great building and we are very pleased to make use of it for tonight. I would now like to call upon Bridget, uh, the editor of this issue, to take you through to the rest of the evening. Thank you. I'd like to also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. As I'm sure you know, the UNSW Law Journal is fortunate to have in each issue two distinct components, a general and a thematic. The general component of issue 39.2 contains eight articles which continue the journal's tradition of publishing material that traverses the contemporary legal landscape. The articles discuss the common law principle of legality and secondary leg legislation, anti-vilification laws and public racism, transitional justice and native title, tort law reform and child sexual assault, Australia's compliance with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, a motor vehicle lemon law, healthy trademarks, fair dealing for the purpose of parody or satire, and finally, corporate governance codes and gender diversity. The thematic component contains five articles exploring the intersection between law and gender and applying a feminist lens to critique the law. Perhaps surprisingly, given that UNSW ran what is considered to be the first law and gender course in Australia, this issue marks the first time that the UNSW Law Journal has published an issue that explicitly focuses on feminist legal theory. I suspect if you're here this evening, I'd be preaching to the converted if I tried to explain why I see feminist legal theory as important or what I believe it has to offer, but perhaps you can humour me slightly as I explain what inspired me to produce this issue. I originally saw the resurgence of feminist discourse in popular culture as a pertinent frame for the thematic component and the issues it attempts to tackle. In recent years, it's become common for female celebrities, I'm sure everyone is aware of Beyonce, uh, to self-identify as feminist, while gendered harms such as domestic violence and sexual assault have gained significant attention in both traditional and new forms of media. And I think that the furor surrounding the Brock Turner sentencing provides a really pertinent example of that. Now, while to some extent this trend has fueled a women are on top now narrative, it's also drawn attention to the very real consequences of ongoing gender inequality. 
And so against the backdrop of these events, I thought it was time for the journal to consider the manner in which legal structures and institutions continue to enact an obscure gender-based inequality, as well as the potential opportunities for such inequality to be resisted and challenged. Working on the issue over the last 14 to 15 months has strongly reinforced the significance for me of a gender-based approach to law. During this time, not only have I had the opportunity to think more deeply about the issues raised in the articles, and it's a wonderful mix ranging from consent narratives in sexual assault trials to the medical and legal erasure of intersex variations. During this, but during this time, I've also worked for a domestic violence court support service. So I've experienced a fascinating intersection of theory and practice. I've seen how horrible, violent, degrading behaviours can be the extreme end of a spectrum of behaviour which in its milder forms may be part of our everyday experience. And I've seen how expectations of women and of a woman's role can shape legal approaches to this behaviour. And how, as a result, while the law may offer support, it often fails to address women's needs. And perhaps especially the needs of women from culturally diverse backgrounds. Obviously, this experience that I've had highlights only one area in which a law and gender lens can offer insight, and it certainly can't capture the diversity of feminist contributions to the law. But it's my hope that this, e that, that this issue, and perhaps this evening as well, will, like my experience over the last year, offer a renewed sense of why a gender-based approach to the law is still so significant whether it be in criminal law, as my experience was, or contract law and the workplace, like Rosanna Bricknell's article on freezing eggs, or even in broader areas such as bankruptcy and corporations law. As the breadth of these subjects suggests, gender-based analysis needn't and in fact shouldn't be confined to special issues such as this. Hopefully, as Professor Greycar suggests in her wonderful forward, this issue will mark the start of an ongoing dialogue in which the gender question is asked across all issues of the UNSW Law Journal, applying as it does to all areas of law. Now, of course, this issue represents the final product of many hours of hard work by different people, all of whom are owed a debt of gratitude. First, I would like to thank Dr. Vicky Sentas, Dr. Justine Rogers, Mara San Roque, and Professor Rosalind Dixon for their helpful advice at different stages of the timeline. I'd also like to reiterate the thanks to our Dean, Professor George Williams, and our faculty advisors, Associate Professors Michael Handler and Lyria Bennett Moses. Their guidance and support is invaluable, and I was very grateful to it throughout my time. Of course, I wish to thank our host for this evening, Ashurst, as well as our premier sponsors, King and Wood Mallisons, Herbert Smith Freehills and Allens, for their ongoing support. Next, I would like to thank the authors, some of whom are here this evening. I'm grateful to the authors of each article in the thematic for giving substance to my original vision and developing it in new and sometimes unanticipated directions. I'd like to express further thanks to all of the authors published in the issue for their patience and dedication over the last year. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with them. I'd also like to thank the anonymous peer reviewers whose considered opinions are so essential to our decision-making structure as a student law journal. Of course, my deepest thanks go to the editorial board. Our former Dean, Professor David Dixon, often said that the board comprised the best and brightest students at UNSW Law, but I believe the work they've put into this issue shows the extent to which they live up to those words of praise. Not only have they worked tirelessly to ensure that each article is aglc to perfection, they've been so passionate about the contents of the articles they worked on and the journal as a whole. More personally, I'm grateful to them for the amusement they provided during the many weekends I spent editing. Watch this space for a published collection of UNSW Law Journal memes. That's all I'll say. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank the executive committee members whose terms have rolled in and out during the course of the last 15 months. Anna, Zhongwei, Amila, Tatiana, Damien, Andy, Max, Zoe, Justin, and of course the 2015 executive editor James Norton and the 2016 executive editor Wean Tan. I don't think I anticipated how much laughter could arise from conversations regarding the AGLC and the peer review process, so I thank them for helping me realise. 
Of course, I'd like to thank my parents who travelled a long way to be here this evening, along with other members of my family in attendance. I promise it's not half the room, but I do feel like there's a small clan of people supporting me. Uh, and finally, a heartfelt thank you to my partner Kyle for endless cups of tea during the editing process. I'm honoured to now introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Reg Graycar. In a wonderful piece of synchronicity, Professor Graycar was the first, I believe, was the first lecturer of UNSW's first law and gender course. So we're very lucky to have her here this evening. Professor Graycar had a long and distinguished career in academia, writing on issues arising from the intersection of law and gender, as well as systemic injuries and law reform. She served as a commissioner at the New South Wales Law Reform Commission between 1998 and 2002, and was director of the Women's Legal Services New South Wales between 2000 and 2009. She commenced practice at the Bar in 2007, where she advises on a diverse range of legal issues, including discrimination and human rights, constitutional law and administrative law. Her book, The Hidden Gender of Law, co-authored with Professor Jenny Morgan and first published in 1990, is regarded as a seminal text on the intersection of law and gender in Australia. So we really couldn't ask for a more perfect key keynote speaker. And without further ado, I'll introduce Professor Rage Graycar. Bridget, executive editor, We Ann Tan, what a great job you've done. Dean George Williams, um, John Pavlakis, the partners at Ashurst. Thank you to all of you assembled here, friends, colleagues, and others. Let me start by congratulating you on yet another outstanding issue of what is truly one of the most highly regarded law journals in Australia. I was so impressed with the quality of the work in it and it's only today that I actually got to see the, uh, the whole issue or yesterday, um, but I had been sent the uh, proofs of the thematic issue and all of the articles are just uh, absolutely outstanding. I'm certainly honoured to have been asked to launch it tonight where my focus is going to be, given the gender focus on the thematic part. But um, as I said, all of the articles are terrific. There's a certain sense of satisfaction, um, a sense of place and even rightness in launching this because, as Bridget mentioned, it's, uh, believe it or not, next year will be 30 years since Law and Gender was first taught at UNSW Law School back in the day. Um, so it seems particularly fitting that UNSW Law Journal is publishing this issue. Things were different. John talked about the clothes and the hairdos um, in 1987. One of the major differences was a very large number of people in this room weren't even born. Um, <laughs> High Court judges certainly weren't familiar with the idea of a course called Law and Gender. I recall vividly a young man in that first class regaling us with tales of his interview with Justice William Dean of the High Court as he showed him his transcript and explained the subjects he was doing. He was like, what's this law and gender? Um, but apparently Justice Dean found it all very interesting and he certainly got the job. Um, and another woman from the class became associate to Justice McHugh. And then they got married and then they had four what we call law and gender babies who are <laughs> all grown up now and I'm reliably informed that at least one of them is studying law at UNSW Law School. So there you go. In the foreword, which in keeping with the theme, I guess, um, that was raised earlier, which was written in uh, Los Angeles, does that fit with the uh, other, <laughs> actually Santa Monica, but who's counting, um, I've set out a very brief account of the development of some of the specialist publications about law that have as their focus the theme of gender or are published from a feminist perspective. And I just want to say this thing about special versus general has always been a theme. Um, going back to the teaching days, 
I always remember the issue of the people coming up and saying, oh, will you teach a class for me on gender? Because I don't know anything about that. And one of our ambitions was to have that become a normal part of a course, not some special thing that only a person, you know, with horns and who was otherwise labelled feminist could teach. So I don't really read too much into the fact that this is the first thematic issue because the important thing is that work is being, has been being done for some time in this area. But it's still wonderful to have it all gathered together into this particular path, uh, this particular part. So in the foreword, I talked a bit about some of those journals um, and also the odd special issue and recounted a little of the history of the book that Bridget mentioned that Jenny Morgan and I did, The Hidden Gender of Law, which uh, we first published in 1990 and did another edition of in 2002. And that book grew out of teaching the course at UNSW and then in turn was used as pretty much a teaching text. Now, we wrote that first edition at a time unthinkable to most of you when there was no internet um, or certainly hadn't reached law schools. There was no email. There were just starting to be thermal paper fax machines, which some people might remember. Jenny got a laptop, that was really exciting. Um, it was the sort of quite a bit bigger than what we would now think of as desktop computers. And we had things called floppy disks. And if you were really lucky, they had the capacity to put one chapter on. And then we would go to the post office and put them in a little posting case and post them to each other in Sydney and Melbourne if we weren't physically writing in the same place. Even the difference between the first and second editions was astronomical and the second edition was, what, 14 years ago, so oh, things are a lot easier now. You can write your things in Hello. <laughs> but so much for ancient history. We describe the hidden gender of law as both a law book and a book about law. We saw it as a mechanism for opening a debate about questions such as what is a gender issue, about legal categories, and about the role of legal categories in perpetuating gendered stereotypes. We were particularly concerned that categories limited the way we thought about gender, and to that end, we didn't have chapters called Crime Taught Contract, uh, rather, we organised the book around themes that were important in women's lives, like money, like work, like women's bodies, and gendered harms. The thematic issue which we're celebrating the publication of today engages with a number of the types of issues that we have been concerned about for these past at least 30 years in law schools. Um, Emma Henderson's and Kirsty Duncanson's article on jury directions in rape trials starts by reminding us of the long history of legislative reform in the area of rape or sexual assault law. And I say sexual assault law, that's what we call it in New South Wales. Their article it's in Victoria is about rape law. As an aside, one of the key legislative reforms we have undertaken in this area um, Professor Stubbs will correct me, but I think it was 1981, was it, when we took the rape out of sexual assault and we replaced it out of the crime and we replaced it with the more gender neutral idea of sexual assault. Now, of course, gender neutrality is itself um, a way of masking the gendered operation of legal doctrines and the gendered uh, nature of lived experience. Just to give you a really, uh, perhaps one of my favourite examples of how this can work is um, there was a publication that decided, oh, we're going to be gender neutral. So the way we're going to achieve that is we're going to use alternating pronouns by chapter. So the chapter on sexual assault had the rapist she because that was, you know, was the next 
chapter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so there's a long history going back to the uh, Henderson and Duncanson article in both policy and academic research that demonstrates rather disappointingly sometimes how limited has been the impact of the many legislative reforms that have occurred in the field of rape law. And in this article, the authors actually give us some scope for at least cautious optimism about the legislative reform they're writing about, which is the timing of jury directions on consent. They suggest that if that's done at the earliest possible time in a trial, rather than at the end, that may have an impact and affect, um, it may dispel some of the harmful rape myths that persist. Kate Gleason theorises about gender justice in the context of child sex abuse in the Catholic Church, something we've heard a lot about in recent years with the Royal Commission on uh, Child Abuse in Institutional Care. Reading her most interesting and timely article reminded me of a moment, a moment in time in the early 1990s when the Ontario government in Canada actually set up an explicitly feminist adjudication and redress process to respond to historical harms that had happened to a group of young women and girls in institutional care in the 60s and 70s in Canada. Now, I don't think in my old age cynicism we're going to see a process like that come out of the Royal Commission or perhaps at any time in you know, my lifetime. But what's so important is that we have a model that we can draw on. And there are other examples, such as the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal that some of you might know about that was established to, in effect, provide a, a people's forum when the Japanese government wasn't doing anything about comfort women. Shelley Bealfield's article about income management and its particularly harsh gendered consequences for Indigenous women provides a timely reminder of a significant shift that occurred in feminist legal scholarship. From the earliest over-enthusiastic days of talking about women as some loose, undifferentiated group, to the key understanding that women, while they might broadly share some elements of their subordinate gender status, are as varied as it is possible to be. They vary by race, by class, by sexual orientation or gender identity, by religion, by physical ability. And it seems unimaginable to us now that it was only in 1989 that Professor Kimberly Crenshaw introduced the language of intersectionality to the way we talk about those differences. Of course we'd always known that women were not the same, but intersectionality gave us a term and a language in which to express that in much the same way that by having a label or a focus, um, Catherine McKinnon once explained, sexual harassment, the event, is not new to women. It is the law of injuries that it is new to. Eileen Kennedy's Fixed at Birth is a piece about the historically immutable gender binary that has permeated or both popular and legal discourses, but it's very much subject to challenge at present, both legally and politically. We need only think about the bathroom law debacle that's going on in North Carolina in the United States. And she also reports on a decision of our own High Court recently um, in Norrie's case, where the court recognised that in New South Wales a person may be noted on a birth certificate as non-specific, which is what Norrie was seeking to have the court decide. Rosanna Bricknell writes about the phenomenon of employer-sponsored oocyte cryopreservation, which is a very 21st century form of control over women's bodies. Now, control over women's bodies, and in particular over their reproductive bodies, has been a key concern of feminist legal scholarship since its inception. And it was both timely and sobering 
to be reminded in June of this year by your own Dean, Professor Williams, that abortion remains a crime in New South Wales, which a lot of people don't seem to know. I know one of my colleagues at the bar looked at me as if I was telling him something crazy <laughs> until I actually had to draw his attention to the relevant provisions of the Crimes Act. Um, it's there in the Crimes Act, subject only to a common law defence of necessity. Well, like many other people, I have been absolutely riveted by the United States conventions that are going on at the moment. And I gave myself an excuse yesterday to spend a lot of time watching it, because when you read the foreword, you'll see I've referred to somebody who was there. So amongst the many hours I spent, don't tell anyone, watching this, I did watch a speech by Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. Now, for those of you who don't know, until four years ago, she wasn't Senator Warren, she was Professor Warren of Harvard Law School. And in fact, that professor thing really doesn't go away. In the New Yorker online this morning, there was a story that said after her speech, she then gave a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> seriously explaining all the financial stuff that was going on. And apparently she was quoted as saying, once a teacher, always a teacher. <laughs> now in her speech yesterday, you might have heard her if you, like me, spent wasteful time watching it. Uh, she talked about Donald Trump's six bankruptcies, about which she said, Bankruptcy had allowed him, in her words, to protect his own money and stick his investors and contractors with the bill. That's what she said. Now, she knows a bit about bankruptcy. That was her area of expertise at Harvard Law School. And in 2002, as a bankruptcy expert, she published an article in the 25th anniversary edition of the Harvard Women's Law Journal, which is now called the Harvard Journal of Law and Gender. And it's called, What is a Woman's Issue? Bankruptcy, Commercial Law, and Other Gender Neutral Topics. The particular focus of that article was her concern about a then pending, and which was ultimately enacted in 2005, um, legislative initiative, a bill, um, that was designed to impose significant restrictions on consumer bankruptcy. Her concern, a concern echoed by a large number of women's organisations, 91 law professors who wrote uh, a letter, uh, a submission about it, was that the proposed law would have a disproportionately negative impact on women and the children in their care. She was involved in a long-running empirical project called the Consumer Bankruptcy Project, which had reported in 1981, 1991, and was about to report its 2001 data. And she found in the 2001 data that divorced women and single-parent woman-headed households constituted 40% of all consumer bankruptcy filings. And when you included women who filed with their husbands, the number of women who filed for bankruptcy in the United States in 2001 was, believe it or not, one million women. The project's data showed that women's, women filing alone for bankruptcy, that is that 40%, the woman, divorced women, woman-headed households, was the fastest growing group and their numbers had increased by 800% in those two decades. She thought the data was wrong. It had to be wrong. The figures were too extreme. And they went back and they did the data again. And that's what the numbers were. And of course, they, they interviewed all the people. The motivation behind most of these women's bankruptcy filings was what she called one significant event, a serious interruption in income usually either a job loss or significant illness. And of course, in the United States, with the, um, certainly until the Affordable Care Act, significant illness often had a very major financial impact. 
She started the article by focusing on another person who we're going to see on television tomorrow and who was in Sydney a couple of weeks ago. I nearly got run down by these screaming motorcycle police and uh, was thought something terrible was happening until I saw all the black tinted window limos. And of course, it was the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden. She says, she starts the article by saying, in 2001, the National Organization of Women celebrated Joe Biden. He was the only politician referred to in their annual report. They had a picture of him with some of their board. He was a champion of the women's movement because he helped them in relation to his support for the Violence Against Women Act. But she says the annual report didn't report all his legislative achievements among which she included his efforts on behalf of the credit industry to increase restrictions on bankruptcy. She said, given that this legislation was going to affect women so disproportionately, she wanted to know why he wasn't getting the same attention. Why wasn't he in trouble with women's groups for his promotion of the bankruptcy legislation? Now, of course, that legislation was gender neutral on its face, but 29 major national women's organisations had written opposing it, and she lists them all in a footnote. They go from, of course, now itself, the National Organisation of Women, which was celebrating him in its annual report, but YWCA, Hadassah, Church Women United, you know, these are not just radical, small feminist groups. These are national major women's organisations. The National Black Women's Health Project, National Council of Jewish Women. More particularly, not one woman's organisation supported the legislation. But the American Bankers Association described itself as lucky to have Biden in support and she has a list, a string of footnotes of media articles saying that his support was pivotal, it was the linchpin. To quote her, without his sponsorship, it is widely believed that a hard to explain bill that favours big banks over families in terrible financial trouble would be dead. More importantly, because he expressly rejected concerns raised about the bill's effect on women, he has shielded his colleagues on both sides of the aisle from being branded as anti-women for their support. She says, it's his support of legislation that helps women and his even more vigorous support of legislation that hurts women that makes her pose the serious question, what constitutes a woman's issue? And that is the bit that leads into the paragraph I quoted in the foreword where she says, she answers her rhetorical question by saying, some issues tied to physical differences between the sexes, abortion, birth control, sexual assault, breast cancer, are clearly labelled women's issues. Other issues close to the hearts of many women, child abuse, child care, elder care, child custody, women in poverty, also make it to the top of the list. Economic issues focusing on equality, equal pay for equal work, equal employment opportunity, equal educational opportunity, find their champions as well. But business and economic topics are often overlooked. Even when women's groups become involved, these issues never seem to become a priority. Moreover, when business topics are on the agenda, there's often a well-funded business group pressing its own interests, drowning out the voices of women. Now, as I said, Senator Biden categorically, Vice President Biden, rejected the claims of the women's groups. And indeed, he went on the offensive. There was this very tiny amendment, which I don't want to go into detail, that he sponsored and then was able to put out this big press release, the bankruptcy bill will not disadvantage women and children. And Professor Warren, Senator Warren, clearly explains how that was just absolutely insignificant in the scheme of things. So I really recommend you read it. And of course, it also had resonances for me with Shelley Bealfield's article about income management, because she refers to organisations such as the Australian Law Reform Commission specifically 
cautioning against the way it was going to be um, about the process itself and pointing out what would be the negative gendered consequences. But of course, those concerns were completely ignored. It's not seen as a gender issue. Um, Warren notes that this dissonance between the recognition of violence against women as a women's issue, but the failure to accept that an issue like bankruptcy is, raises a troubling spectre of women exercising powerful political influence within only a very limited scope, such as rape laws or equal educational opportunity, but wielding little influence in business or other supposedly gender neutral areas that profoundly affect many women. And the same is, of course, true in legal discourses. What we recognise as an issue in law affected by gender is also profoundly limited in the same way as it was possible for then Senator Biden to assert that the bankruptcy bill would not harm women, notwithstanding what every woman's organisation was saying, which sounds to me like a bit of mansplaining. Now, I don't want to be seen as on an anti-Joe Biden rant because, in fact, um, Bridget mentioned, I think, the, who's his name, Brock Turner, Brock Turner um, Stanford rape situation, and, and Vice President Biden, you know, wrote a very profoundly moving open letter to the woman who was assaulted in that case. Like, this is a guy who actually genuinely appears to get violence against women. From his position as Vice President, he didn't have to write that. That was a really impressive move on his part. So, more power to him. But that makes it even more bizarre that he doesn't get how something like bankruptcy, otherwise apparently gender neutral, can have such negative, genderedly harmful effects. Anyway, so if there's a takeaway from this, I just want you all to think about some area of law that you've never imagined is affected by gender. And how many of you have done international law? Hmm, okay. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, I won't even go there, it's all right. <laughs> Other than to say that three Australian, then Australian feminist legal scholars won some major big prize from the American Society of International Law for writing an article called Feminist Approaches to International Law at a time when nobody could have imagined that international law had anything to say about gender and some people probably still think that. So go away and think about it. Next time you're in a class about something, think about you know what might be the gendered impact of what looks to me like an otherwise facially gender neutral law. How have gendered stereotypes affected how that legal doctrine has developed? Not least, you might remember that since only men even were allowed to be legal actors until relatively recently, and only uh, and women didn't even vote. How has legislation been drafted? How has common law developed on the experience of a fairly skewed pool of the population? But that's an ongoing project. That's not our work tonight. Our work tonight is basically to celebrate the publication of this wonderful issue, both the general and the thematic issue, and I am really impressed by the extraordinary quality of the work that's gone into it. So please join with me in congratulating the editors and all the authors and all the editorial workers and everybody who had any role in making this wonderful collection of contributions to legal scholarship see the light of day, to this, the light of sunset this evening. <laughs> Thank you. This journal, the University of New South Wales Law Journal, is our flagship publication of the faculty. It's one that's renowned not just in Australia but internationally as a journal that breaks big ideas in law, that's forward-looking, that is really a premier product when it comes to thought leadership across the law. 
And it's befitting for us as a faculty that's now ranked 13th in the world amongst all law schools that we have a journal that uh, is very much on par with that. And what's especially pleasing for us is that this is a student-run journal. Uh, it demonstrates with great pride on our part the intellectual skills of our students, their capacity for enormous hard work. I mean, this was a 15-month product to produce this journal. And it shows that our students prior to graduation are able to really mix it on the world stage with uh, journals that are produced with higher resources and indeed have a much longer lineage. It was very appropriate that this issue tonight was launched by REG. Uh, we're also very proud of the fact that uh, REG is one of our alumni. She, of course, uh, spent much of her time as an academic with us. And Reg is someone who for many years has been an inspiring scholar within this field of feminist law and indeed gender and the law generally. It's fair to say that very, very few academics have had the influence and impact that she has had uh, within this field. 30 years ago, she started teaching in law and gender. A bit later, she, with Jenny Morgan, wrote the book on the hidden gender of the law. And here we are today, decades later, celebrating her work and continuing to talk about its enduring influence and impact. And uh, so much academic scholarship disappears, doesn't take hold. By contrast, her work touched on something deep, powerful and profound about the structure of law within this country and indeed internationally. And she was at the forefront of a movement here in Australia that very much has gone international in terms of helping us understand uh, just how much gender is an integral part of how the law operates and our constant search for justice within that framework. It's something that's had a big impact upon us too as a faculty. Uh, if we look at when Reg Lester left us in 1997, the world for the faculty was a very different place. Since then, we now have a very clear majority of our graduates that are female. Women are leading the way as our graduates, are entering great firms like this and uh, going on to do things at the most senior parts of the legal profession, including three out of the seven High Court judges, in a way that was seemingly unthinkable at that time. Within our own staff, we're now in the very happy position where a majority of our professors are female. And uh, sometimes people ask me, well, how do you do that? And how do you get away with doing that? What were the costs of uh, employing so many women at that level? And the short answer for us is that it is the reason for our success. It's the great enabler that we have managed to attract so many won wonderful women at that level. And uh, it's striking for me, quite recently at a meeting of deans, that people are still quite perplexed about this issue, that how could we have so many, how could we be, be so successful uh, with so many senior women? It says, I think, that uh, just how much there is to do in this area, that uh, we are still talking about this issue today, that uh, the reason for Reg's enduring success is not just the power of her ideas, but equally that these ideas are so relevant and needed. And in an era where many of our graduates come to us thinking that perhaps gender equality is not an issue, that it's critically important that we open their eyes to the fact that it's very real, present, including within employment, within academic ranks. When we come, of course, to the content of the law, as Reg has mentioned, uh, abortion is still a crime in this state, as it is in Queensland. And in fact, we've had charges laid in Queensland and uh, New South Wales in recent years in relation to that provision. We, of course, have deep-seated problems when it comes to the law as relates to domestic violence, sexual assault, a range of criminal areas. And outside of that, when we come to who makes the law, we're now in a position where the coalition government, federally, will, it seems, have 17 women amongst its uh, lower house party room, which is the lowest number of women since 1993 that a governing party has had in Australia. So this is not a one-way track in terms of achieving gender equality. And that will have, I think, a very large influence upon how laws are made and indeed the perspective of women in that lawmaking process. On the High Court, we may have a majority of women, perhaps, at the end of this year, if Justice Susan Kiefel is appointed as Chief Justice and another woman is appointed, and that would be a remarkable world-leading achievement if that occurs in Australia. On the other hand, if you look at the people appearing before the High Court, it is still relatively unusual to see a woman in a speaking part in the High Court today. And uh, as someone who appears regularly in the High Court, it is very noticeable the many talented women at the solicitor's table. On the other hand, the very few talented women who are giving speaking parts in the High Court. And that again says something structurally about our legal profession and the issues that we need to address. 
So I suppose what this all shows is just why this is so important, why this is such an important law journal issue today. We're not harking back to ideas from 30 years ago, but constantly rediscovering their relevance today. And we must do so, lest the hidden gender of the law, as Regis' book suggests, remains hidden. We need to expose, to interrogate, and to understand these problems. What I'd finally like to do is I'd like to thank the premier sponsors of the journal, and in particular, I'd also like to thank Ashurst for providing this fabulous venue uh, for this event today. It's a wonderful building, very different to Grosvenor Place, where I began my career with Ashurst many years ago, and I was very, uh, very chuffed to receive such a warm welcome back from John, who remembered me all those years ago. I wondered whether he would have, because of course I was a, a very young graduate just out of university. I spent a couple of years here wondering what I was going to do with my life and uh, ended up as a constitutional lawyer. I might have stayed here, but the constitutional law practice was never that large uh, within any firm, let alone Asher's, so I had to tread other fields. We're very proud that the firm has sponsored the journal today. As I've said, it's one of the world's leading journals and it seems fitting that one of the world's leading law firms has been prepared to support us in this way. It's also fitting because so many of our very best graduates come to Ashurst. And uh, I was looking at the stats recently and uh, just under half of a recent intake by Ashurst came from UNSW law grads. So there's a very clear path for our journal editors and others to come to this firm. It's a long-standing relationship that uh, through the journal and in other ways we're keen to maintain. The last thing I'd like to say is, uh, of course, a big congratulations to the authors here tonight. Um, I well understand the work that goes into these articles. I will understand the treadmill that the editors put you on as authors, um, querying the footnotes, verifying references. This is a rigorous, high quality product that uh, puts enormous burdens on authors. And of course, in particular, I'd like to say well done to Bridget and her team. Uh, the students work enormously hard to produce a product of this quality. And uh, it's a real team effort among those students. It's late nights, pizzas, beer, all sorts of things, I suspect. <laughs> Camaraderie is a key part of it. And uh, we're really pleased that uh, the, journals, uh, the journal editors have once again uh, produced such a great product that uh, lives up to the reputation of the faculty and also this world-leading journal. Thank you, Bridget.